Dear listeners, a quick note about today's episode. The events depicted are based on a real-life story, though some names have been changed, and we have used actors to reenact scenes. In most cases, we cannot be certain exactly what was said, but all of our dramatizations are based on research. It's the morning of July 17th, 1995 in Pretoria, South Africa. The sun is shining brightly but the weather is a bit chilly. A Toyota Corolla drives into the parking lot of an office building. Behind the wheels of the car is 34-year-old Eva Middleton. She parks the car, grabs her handbag, her water flax, steps out and quickly makes her way into the office building. She has a lot of work to do. Eva is a forensic psychologist and the first criminal profiler in South Africa. Her job is to analyze the evidence and develop a psychological picture of a criminal's behavior and characteristics. Eva loves her job and just two days before, she was assigned to a task force at the Pretoria Murder and Robbery Unit. The task force is looking into a string of murders that have been happening in Attridgeville. Attridgeville is a small town 30 minutes west of Pretoria and about a one hour drive from Johannesburg. Eva enters her office where she has files stacked on her desk. Inside her office is a bit warmer. She drops her flags and handbag. Then she removes her coat. And as she sits, she picks up one of the files on her office desk. The file is for the first victim found in Attridgeville. The woman's body was found on the 4th of January, 1995. When she was found, her skin was already decomposed, exposing her intestines. Her dress was drawn up over her breast and there was no ID for her. Eva drops the file and picks up the next one, the second victim. 27-year-old Beauty Soko. Beauty was found on February 9, 1995, about one month after the first victim. Her body was left naked with her clothes on top of her and stones were placed on her body. According to the file, Beauty had left her home in January to visit her sister in Pretoria but never made it back home. Eva goes through another victim's file, 25-year-old Sarah Mukono. Sarah's body was discovered by construction workers in Attridgeville on the 6th of March 1995, about two months after the first victim was found. Sarah had left her home on the 3rd of March to meet a man about a job. Eva drops the fire and picks up another file, letter Ndlanga Mandla. Letter was found dead in a veld, an open field in Attridgeville. Eight days after her body was found, her son, a toddler at the time, was discovered not far from his mother's body. He had an open bruise on his head. Eva goes through more files and she starts to notice a pattern. All of these women were young black women, killed in almost the same way. They were strangled and raped. As she's about to pick up another file, her phone begins to ring. She drops the file and picks up the phone. Hello, this is Eva. It's Jacob, the head of the task force. Oh, good morning, sir. Um, the police all found another body. We need to head up to the crime scene now. Oh, okay. I'm coming now. Eva hangs up, grabs a juta and dashes out of her office. She walks out of the building and gets into Jacob's car. As a drive to meet the rest of the team, her mind is still on the case files she just reviewed. She's beginning to think this might be the work of a serial killer. Eva and Jacob arrive at the crime scene. It's a forest in the Attridgeville area. There are already a handful of police and forensic experts roaming all over the place. The stench in the area is overpowering. Jacob hands Eva a face mask. She puts on the mask and walks over to where the body is. The body, a woman, is laying on her stomach, fully clothed. Eva moves closer to the body, 
One of the forensic experts leaves the cloth covering the body. Eva is immediately taken aback by what she sees. The woman's face is covered with maggots the size of a rugby ball, feasting on her rotten face. Eva is shocked by the scene, but she catches her breath and walks forward again to look closely at the body. The woman had been strangled with a piece of her clothing, same pattern as the others. Eva knew in her guts that a new serial killer is in Atridgeville. A few hours later, Eva is back in her office in Pretoria. She drops her notepad on her office desk and reaches for a pack of cigarettes and lighter from her coat pocket. Eva taps one of the cigarettes out of the pack and lights it. She knows that serial killers will kill until they are stopped. This one has already killed at least eight women already. She takes a drag from her cigarette and slowly exhales. Eva drops her cigarette in the ashtray, opens a file on her desk and takes out the picture of the victim that she just saw in the forest, Granny Remelo. She turns to tape the photo to the whiteboard in her office. The board already has the photos of eight other victims and a collage of news clippings about the murders. As she's about to tape the photo, there's a knock on her office door. A chubby man in his mid-forties enters the room. He's dressed in a dark blue jeans and a grey long sleeve shirt. This is Jacob Peterson, head of the Attridgeville Tax Force. Uh, so, what do you think? Well, it's definitely a serial killer. I just can't tell if it is one person or multiple but the patterns are really they're different, you know? Like this one, her hands were left untied, alright? And this woman here, hands were tied in front, while the hands of this woman was tied behind. This woman strangled her with a piece of clothes. And he used the garret. I mean, this whole thing is, is not consistent. It doesn't correlate. No. Hang on. I think we're looking at all these bodies in the wrong day. What do you mean? We have been looking at these bodies in the way that they were found, right? Yeah. What if we look at the bodies in the way that they died? Eva picks up one of the files on her table and shows it to Jacob. There's been progression in the way they have been killed. Exactly. So this killer, which I now think is one person and is a man, is getting more advanced with his killings. First, he left the women's hands in tight. Then he started to tie his victim's hands to the front and then to the back, making it easier for him to control his victims. And then this latest victim, Granny, he strangled her with a piece of cloth. He is developing more methods to make him enjoy his kids. That bastard. He's torturing them. He is. This is just the beginning. And if we don't catch him soon enough, he is going to develop more methods to touch on his victims. Over the next several weeks, Eva and the tax team continue to find the bodies of decomposing women, and just like Eva had predicted, the killer was using more violent methods to strangle his victims. For example, two women's bodies were found hanging from trees and all the victims were black women who had gone missing while on the jump hunt. It's the 13th of August, almost a month since they found Granny's body in the forest and Eva is reviewing new cases in her office. Her phone begins to ring. She picks up. Eva leaves her office and heads upstairs. 
As she walks to the interrogation room, her mind is racing. She can't believe the killer has been caught. She approaches the interrogation room where she sees Jacob and another detective in front of the door. From afar, Eva could hear the detective. Why did you call her? We need her. Besides, she'll be able to tell us if the guy we have in there is the killer or not. The detective goes inside as Eva walks up to Jacob. He is not happy. I'm here. No, he is not. You think that's our guy in there? That I don't know. But he was caught trying to rape his friend's daughter. And besides, he confessed to the killings. Just like that? Just like that. He told the police that actually that he did the killings and that he has personality disorder. I know. Look, come. I want you to meet this guy. They both enter the interrogation room. Inside the room, the other detective is seated and to his right is a man in handcuffs. The man is in his late 30s. Jacob takes a seat and Eva does the same. Eva is studying the suspect. So how did you kill these women? I raped and strangled them. Just like that? Yes. How? It is because... I have pers multiple personal disorder. You mean personality disorder? Yeah. Thank you. So, by that, what do you mean by it? Oh. Multiple personality disorder? You don't know. You know, I change into different people of my people. Like now, I am German soldier. <laughs> Spreken the Deutsche. Sprechen the Deutsch. Oh! It's just espresso's escapostage. That doesn't make sense. You're not speaking German. I swear I am not lying. I am not lying. See? As the interrogation proceeded, the suspect claimed to be an Arab man and even a woman. At this point, Evan knew this wasn't how multiple personality disorder works, and she's convinced this is not their serial killer. She steps out of the room, and Jacob and the detective follow her. red-handed trying to rape and strangle a girl i know yeah i mean yeah he's a criminal not just the one we're looking for he's not smart enough the guy we're looking for is smart he has a method something is driving him to kill i mean he's not raping and strangling all these women randomly he's not going after sex workers he is specifically targeting young career black women the guy we're looking for is in his late 20s. That guy in there is in his 30s. And I also think our guy is a flashy dresser and a sophisticated ladies man. I, I agree with you. You know, I mean, that is how we have access to all of these bright, sunny women. You know, they are more inclined to following someone who is the resemblance of a businessman. Exactly. And I also think our guy drives a car. Come on, Jacob. Are you buying this? A car? Yeah. Well dressed? Listen. If that guy in there is our man, then we should make him take us to where he buried the bodies. When the suspect was asked to point out where he buried his victims, he failed. He pointed out the wrong crime scenes, proving he was not the one they were looking for. The serial killer was still at large, and between August and September, more bodies turned up around the Attridgeville area. It's 6 a.m. on the 19th of September. Another month has gone by, and Eva is on her way to Boxburg. Boxburg is about an hour's drive south from Pretoria. The night before, Eva had received a call from Jacob. A police reservist had discovered a decomposing woman's body while taking his dog out for a walk in Van Dyck Mine. 
Bandik Mine is this big open gold mining field in Boxburg. The police stormed the area and found nine more bodies. Eva arrives at the scene, she parks her car and steps out. Jacob waves her over. Eva takes a few steps in his direction and suddenly stops when she's hit by the strong stench of death and decomposing bodies. Eva holds her breath as she continues to walk towards Jacob. She can see decomposed bodies scattered over the veil, some only a few meters away from others. Are you alright? Mm -hmm. Eva responds through her nose, trying not to breathe in the air. She looks to her right and just a few feet away, a woman's body is lying on her stomach. Eva noticed the skin around her arms had not bloated yet. These bodies are fresh. Yes, some are very recent. Eva scans the area. Everywhere she turns, there's a body. So like, this place is like his dumping ground? Uh, I think so. I think he likes to bring the bodies here just to scare them, probably. <laughs> so like, bringing new victims to show old bodies just to get them to be submissive? Exactly. Eva looks around the field. Her eyes fall on another body, a woman wearing jeans. And there was a wet patch on her jeans where she had wet herself. She must have been afraid. Eva suddenly feels very tired. She walks back to her car and alone in her car, she sobs. In the next few days, Eva continues to study the Van Dyck mine crime scene. The women found there, just like the other victims, were bound, raped and strangled. In the end, only six of these women were identified. The police tried to keep the Van Dyck mine location a secret away from the public, but the news was leaked. People stormed the area and even the president at the time, Nelson Mandela, visited the site. Now there's more urgency around the case and another tax force was set up. This particular tax force was much smaller, more tight-lipped, even Eva was kept out of the loop. There's a knock on the door. Quasi and her husband are at home and they weren't expecting anyone that day. Quasi goes to open the door. On the other side were two police officers. Good day, ma'am. Sorry to bother you. Quasi calls up to her husband and he walks over to the front door. Yes, I need help. Uh, does this phone number belong to you? The officers show Quasi a piece of paper with a number on it. It's just our phone number. Is there a problem? Uh, do you know? Amelia Rakuji. No, but I do remember writing down that name. Quasi goes inside and returns with the Jota. Yes. She flips through it. Here is the name. Amelia Rakuji. She shows the officers the name and underneath the name is a number. Below Amelia's information, the police see other names and numbers for Midred Lipuli, Makoba Makutsi, and Monica. The officers look at each other. Quasi rushes to explain. Um, these are the names of job seekers for my brother's NGO. It's called Youth Against Abuse. He told me to write down contact information of everyone coming for the job. Okay, where is your brother now? Moses. I don't know. He usually calls to collect the information. What's his name? What's your brother's name? Moses Itoye. For weeks now, the police have not released any new information to the public. The press conferences have become a routine just to let the public know they are still working the case. One morning after a press conference, Eva is walking to her car and a few journalists rush to catch up with her. Excuse me, excuse me, good day, ma'am. Ma'am, can you give us any new comment on the case? Anything new? I haven't been involved in the investigations recently, so I have nothing to share. Do you think you'll be caught? I'm very sure the police will catch you. I think ever since the police stopped sharing information, the killer is getting anxious. He will call someone soon. Someone he thinks has some kind of information about what is going on. He might even call it. Okay. 
Join us next week to find out who is on the other end of that call. For this episode, we relied on several sources, including the A&E biography Moses Sitolo, the South African Strangler, True Crime South Africa, the podcast, and Catch Me a Killer, a book written by Miki Pistorius. We will include the links to our sources in the episode notes. True Crime Niger is a Triple E Media production. Production copyright 2021 Triple E Media Productions. This episode was written by Johnny Woody and Ramat Mohamed. Produced by Senet Ewa and Antonietta Kalunta. Directed by Senet Ewa and Antonietta Kalunta. Executive producer Ramat Mohamed. Videography and video editing Uche Mba. Sound recording, mixing, and mastering Double D Tabakaji. Special thanks to Richard Andrews Eva, Jide Bolarinwa as Jacob, Jude Polikap James as Junior Detective, Eunice Honshi Donald as Kwasi, Sariki, Ahmed Abdullahi Aluga, John Iwodi, Sam Tabakaji, Prince Gilbert Owen, and Joy Bulus Anzai. <laughs>